I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. A few words about that meditation and stages, if you will, during a single time of practice and also stage stages over the long haul of our life of practice. Uh, you may have experienced it during the meditation itself, that in the beginning, um, it's as if a part of you, kind of a center of executive action in the mind is, is um, attempting to cultivate, to drop into certain ways of being. And so it's as if in the beginning, uh, there's the part of you that's kind of observing your own mind and nudging it one way or another. Then you're observing that which you're attempting to cultivate, such as continuity of awareness of breathing. And then there's, some, there's also an awareness of that which would pull you away from or hinder or cover over that which you're cultivating. It's very normal. And then, as I said, in terms of stages or progression, gradually the, that which you're attempting to cultivate becomes more prominent, more stable. For example, increasingly you're able to witness that there is indeed a steadiness of mind. You're increasingly immersed in breathing. You're aware of your mind getting quieter. So you're aware that which you're cultivating. And then, in, if you will, a kind of a third stage here, it starts to happen that you begin to abide as, you become, if you will, identified with that which you've been cultivating. In, in this case, a movement toward an, an embodied, um, spaciousness and opening of a loving awareness, abiding as that opening, expansive, loving awareness. That's a natural progression. And it can be so frustrating sometimes when you start to drop into abiding as that which you've cultivated and you start to recognize that, and then instantly you're separated from it. You're witnessing it again. But over time, you learn how to just kind of give over to it and, and be it, and let it carry you along. And that then becomes increasingly stable uh, as time passes and you continue to practice. So I just kind of want to mark those, those steps, if you will, uh, and acknowledge how natural they are and that it can take a while. Uh, things can sometimes get in the way. Uh, I've definitely had experiences where, gosh, yesterday <laughs> I was really dropped in, but today, uh, you know, <laughs> best I could do is sort of observe something, you know, useful in my mind that's not really very stable right now. Uh, you know, it's okay, but over time you get to settle in. So just being aware of these kind of three steps. Well, I would like to talk about um, conflict between, or what can feel like a tension or a choice, and get pulled in different directions between, in a nutshell, what do we owe to others and what do we owe to ourselves? And how do we balance that, including in relationships that are really important to us, like with uh, our adult children or vulnerable aging parents? or society altogether? What do we owe humanity? What do we owe other species that are being driven to extinction through human activity? What do we, what do we owe there? While at the same time, how do we balance what do we owe to ourselves? This is an area with a lot of uh, friction and complication for many of us, ranging from, uh, you know, how do we manage 
an intimate relationship with our mate, perhaps? Uh, how do we you know, work things out with um, people who want things from us that we know could help them if we gave those things, and yet giving those things will be an hour of our time or even 10 minutes of our time, times five times a day, that really adds up. How do we balance that? How do we balance those considerations? So I want to approach this not in a frame of uh, some kind of rule, not in a frame of um, there's a right answer because the answer will really vary, but more in the frame of acknowledging two different streams coming together and sometimes with turbulence between them and creating a larger kind of frame that can hold both streams, duty to others, duty to self, and can hold the turbulence sometimes, the difficult choices sometimes, um, when they when they come together. And uh, I'm going to present a few things and then particularly open it up for discussion. And if, if you do have a question for me as an individual, please try to make sure you have an actual question distinct from sharing your experience or describing events that have happened to you. Is there a question? And a question that's fairly succinct and of general interest, as best you can. Okay, so I want to drop into the chat a couple of really significant texts that have come down to us in the Buddhist tradition. Um, the first of these texts, which I hope I can fit into a single chat copy and paste, um, is from the famous Metta Sutta the Loving-Kindness Sutta. Let's see if, yes. Okay, so let's read this together, and I'll read it out loud. May all beings be happy and secure. May all beings be happy at heart. Omitting none, whether they are weak or strong, seen or unseen, near or distant, born or to be born, may all beings be happy. Let none deceive another or despise anyone anywhere or through anger or ill will wish for another to suffer. Just as a mother would protect her child, her only child, with her own life, even so you should cultivate a boundless heart toward all beings. You should cultivate kindness toward the whole world with a boundless heart, above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without enmity or hate. Whether standing, walking, sitting, or lying down, as long as you are alert, you should be resolved upon this mindfulness. This is called a sublime abiding here and now. Beautiful, beautiful words echoing down to us through the centuries. Um, this uh, summary here is adapted from a slightly longer metta sutta based on a couple of different translations into English from the original Pali that I've, I've done some editing with. Um, it's not the entire traditional metta sutta, but I think it definitely is the heart of the matter um, and definitely something that I could get into a single PowerPoint slide. So we have that on the one hand, which includes all beings. Gosh, am I among all beings? Are you among all beings? Yeah, but still the thrust of the sutta is very much toward, you know, a, just an, a boundless, omitting none, kindness and generosity um, and good wishes for others. It's pretty far reaching, isn't it? How do we understand that, right? And then, let's see here, I want to, you see the sutta, can you see it? You cannot see the text in the chat? Oh, ah, <laughs> I had to push the button. Okay, rewind. Good, okay, so check out the sutta in the text. Okay, and let's stay focused on the topic here in the chat. Hmm. 
All right. Then I want to add another far-reaching teaching um, that also is something for us to think about. And this time I'll push the arrow to share it with all of you. Good. Okay. This is one of my favorite teachings. This uh, is the opening inscription for my uh, book, Neurodharma. Train yourself in doing good that lasts and brings happiness. Cultivate generosity, a life of peace, and a mind of boundless love. Really pretty far-reaching, especially if you unpack the particular words here. So on the one hand, we have a pretty strong statement in the Buddhist tradition, which we need to see for ourselves what rings true to us, what we care about, what seems valuable, uh, what we test over time and find over time, yes, there's value in these teachings. That's the framework here. So here we have two texts and there are many, many others I could cut and paste in really readily that are about basically generosity toward others, caring toward others, uh, doing right by others, giving to others, 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 right? On the one hand, okay, but what about me? Me, 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 what about me? How do we bring that in? Before I go there though, I'm gonna comment on a couple of questions that have come in about this so far. A key one from Mary Lynn, uh, 57 minutes past the hour. Rick, does this prayer, it could be framed as a prayer, as a prayer an invocation, an aspiration, an instruction um, from our teacher, the Buddha. Does this prayer include toward people who are chronically abusive? And deep, deep question. So basically, like the whole of the teachings in Buddhism, they have, in effect, two aspects to them. They have the aspect that's a truth statement. They're a assertion of fact in some way or you know that which is true and then we step back and we judge it yeah is that actually true but in particular they're framed as that which is pragmatic that which is onward leading toward less suffering and harm for oneself and others and more happiness and welfare they're judged pragmatically so in that pragmatic frame of onward leading they're aspirational very important point they're aspirational. And so we find our way into them wherever we are. In the beginning, we might find our way in with this particular sutta to applying it to one person in our life, the one we love most dearly, okay? And then maybe over time, we extend it increasingly to others who are friends, others who are benefactors, even others who are neutral to us, and then even toward people that are challenging and difficult. The ultimate expression of this aspiration is all the way to complete awakening. The Buddhist path invites us to go all the way, or at least as far as we can, treading the path with care, conscientiousness and heartfeltness, treading our path with care all the way we can in this life. So, you know, even beings who are, as you as farther and farther along, you find subtler and subtler granularity of um, implementation of this teaching. You find in that subtler and subtler granularity of implementation, that's a phrase. Anyway, you find yourself uh, coming back to baseline, coming back to center faster. Uh, you get irked, you get triggered. <laughs> You come back to that centeredness in which this attitude and intention of loving kindness is, is living through you. You come back to it much more quickly. 
increasingly quickly. And then over time, things that used to trigger you a lot start triggering you less and less, just a little, and then eventually they, they trigger you not at all over time. So it's okay. It's okay. And it's not skillful to look at a teaching that's expressed as an instruction from Coach Buddha, Dr. Buddha, Saint Buddha, depending on your orientation there. It's not useful to orient to that in instruction in a kind of yes, but way that throws out edge cases. And then on the basis of just not finding any kind of authentic truth for yourself or usefulness for yourself in, in the teaching toward that edge case, throw away everything, toss that baby out with, with the bathwater. Uh, that's not very useful. Uh, so yeah, in principle, the uh, stance of kindness and not ill will and the wish that others be happy. Notice that this is about the release of ill will and a wishing toward others. It's about an orientation toward others. It's about increasingly finding a stance in which your loving awareness uh, radiates from you as if it's from a Wi-Fi base station and others move through that field. Un the radiation of it is unconditional. Now in that context, um, this does not mean that we let others uh, abuse us. It does not mean that we turn a blind eye to their abuse of others. It means being skillful out in the world, which is where I also want to go next with that other current running side by side, you know, with this current of unconditional omnidirectional loving kindness. Right. So let's take a look at that other current now, and I'll drop some other things into the chat. Okay. Great. I can see many, many examples. And by the way, when you do offer things in the chat, uh, please do not um, instruct others or try to educate others about things. Um, focus on your own experience, your own practice, what you're struggling with yourself, you know, how it is for you maybe a situation you're dealing with, um, that's useful. That's really useful and appropriate in, this, in the settings here. So now I want to put in a different kind of a current, which literally is about a current. I'll read it. Um, if one going down into a river swollen and swiftly flowing, is carried away by the current, how can one help others across? Right. And, you know, there are other common examples of this, like from airlines, put your own oxygen mask on first. Um, you know, you have to fill up your own cup um, in order to have much to offer to others. If you're running on empty yourself, it's really hard to sustain the marathon uh, of contributing to others in this life. There's a practical wisdom here. And we have, of course, the example in the Buddha's own life in which uh, on the eve of the birth of his uh, only child, he walked away. I mean, he did it in a certain kind of culture at the time. That said, he walked away, probably in his late 20s, um, from his own uh, wife, his uh, infant child, and he, uh, whose name was Rahula, which could be translated as fetter, like, you know, a handcuff or a chain. That's an interesting way to think about a child as a fetter, uh, imprisoning someone. He walked away. You know, we could think about the morality of that in terms of this first current. You know, did he practice, you know, loving kindness and a mind of boundless love toward his own young family, on the one hand? On the other hand, clearly, he did pursue his own awakening in ways that have benefited millions, perhaps billions of people over the last 2,500 years. It's complicated. So um, we have this teaching here, 
and then I will drop in another quotation. Um, where are we here? This is from the Dalai Lama and Howard Cutler. which talks about the cultivation in ourselves of wholesome, beneficial states of being. I'll read it. Buddhism values, quote, the cultivation of happiness, the genuine inner transformation by deliberately selecting and focusing on positive mental states. All right. So right there, we have a very straightforward statement about the valuing in Buddhism of personal practice whose aim is the cultivation of what we could call happiness in the broadest sense, uh, which I um, think of in a bought in an embodied way as the combination, a blend of um, peacefulness, contentment, and love which have to do with what we naturally come home to when we are not disturbed by craving. And we are not disturbed by craving when there's an experience in the moment of needs met enough. If you think of the fundamental biology, the biological basis of craving. And there's a lot of implications wrapped up in that very summary statement I offered right there which values the cultivation of various inner strengths that can help us meet our needs. So there's no basis actually for craving in the moment. And uh, it's very useful over time to internalize, as Howard and the Dalai Lama are speaking here about, to internalize again and again wholesome, beneficial mental states. Okay. Um, by the way, I think you can copy, I do this routinely, you can actually copy, there you go, someone's telling you how to copy uh, and paste these texts and put them elsewhere, which is great. Thanks, Derek. Tech support, great. Um, okay, so we have these two currents, right? We have these two currents. So consider how these two currents operate in your own life and how you balance between them. No right answer a question of balance, a question of timing. Um, and I'm going to add now a final quote that for me in some ways brings these two currents together. Okay. I am going to find it. Where, oh, where? Ah. Aha, here we go. That's right under my nose. Here we go. So, feel into the, the tone, the energy, the vibe of this uh, quotation. One is not wise because one speaks much. One is wise who is peaceable, friendly, and fearless. For me that those three, peaceable, friendly, and I think we have there a combination of self-interest and selfless interest and fearless. We have something there that's very much about um, taking care of yourself, recognizing conditions, not being a fool. Um, we can be fearless without being foolish, uh, but fundamentally deep inside, not being cowed or intimidated and having a kind of fundamental um, courage in standing up for yourself and taking care of your own needs. Yeah, great. Now the fearlessness, Dan, here, 
I think, is not at all about not recognizing threats. Um, it's about finding a place inside that is not disturbed by them and takes them into account, but is not intimidated. Uh, fear is a natural emotion like anger or grief or shame. We experience it, comes and goes. Uh, but there's a certain a sense of moxie. We could maybe translate that fearless word, not too literally, but we could think of it in terms of moxie or you know, a kind of pluck, pluck, pluckiness on our own behalf. Uh, I think of the little kitten, you know, <laughs> standing it up for itself, uh, you know, hissing at the big dog. Uh, anyway, okay, so let's talk about this. How in the world do we balance these two currents? This is where I appreciate your own examples, your own stories. How do you actually do it? And here I'd like to offer a couple of guidelines from my own experience for you to consider. Right. So <clears throat> one way into this might seem a little intellectual, but actually it can be really shocking and revelatory in good ways. In other words, start by asking yourself, maybe you have a situation where you're kind of grappling, how do I balance my duty to you my care, my concern, my loving kindness toward you, how do I balance that toward taking care of myself? How do I balance that with taking care of myself? Good. First off, one thing to ask yourself is, what, do, what duties do people in general have to each other? Take yourself out of the equation for a minute, right? And very often what you start to realize is that um, we're imposing on ourselves. We can err on two sides, but if we're erring on one side of overhelping others, giving up our own truth for the sake of harmony with others, for example, if we tend to tilt in that direction, one corrective is to really ask ourselves, do I, do I actually owe them that much? Do they owe others? Do they owe me that much? Do others though owe them that much? Right? And often the answer is no. Often when you really look at it closely, you realize, wow, I'm going way overboard here. Far more than that other person is going overboard for me. And far more than they go overboard for other people. I'm imposing on myself obligations, self-censoring, playing small, walking on eggshells, um, making myself responsible for their problems and their upsets. You know, I'm assuming that somehow, oh, if they're upset, I must have done something wrong, or oh, if they're upset, I have to make it better. I'm the one who's responsible for making it better over there. Um, oh, oh. You start to realize, wow, maybe not, you know, maybe not. Um, that's a nice corrective there. Another thing to ask ourselves, really, is when the dust settles, Have I been in this day a way I really want to be? And this is where I want to drop into uh, the chat so you can see it. Um, a little uh, thing I wrote to a friend of mine who's a Buddhist monk in New Zealand a few years ago, a couple of years ago. And so um, see if it can make sense to you. So here we go. So why don't you read that? I want to take a look at what others have written. Huh? 
Okay, great. So I'll read it here. Um, this is me. I'm not quoting the Buddha. <laughs> Take it with a big grain of salt, what I'm saying here. So I wrote to my friend, uh, if I may share something of my own practice these days, plus related conceptualizing and reflections. First, I'm guided a lot by these teachings. Quote, the mind takes the shape of what it rests upon. And we can take the fruit as the path. And I don't know if there are enlightened beings, but I know there are enlightened moments from Suzuki Roshi. And the Tibetan saying, moments of awakening many times a day, as well as sudden awakening, gradual cultivation, sudden awakening. So I say to myself, or suggest to others, rest your mind upon what calls your heart. That for me, by the way, is, the, is at least for myself, the fundamental meditation instruction. There are preparatory practices in meditation where we calm the body, we stabilize the posture, we set our intentions. And then increasingly, for me, meditation is a wonderful opportunity to rest in that which we are cultivating, much as Howard Cutler and the Dalai Lama talked about. So we can rest our mind upon what calls our heart or draws our heart, keeping in mind the teaching that the mind takes its shape from what it rests upon. And I'm also... Uh, you know, reflect upon what's the most enlightened thing you know is true? And can you rest awareness in that? That's an interesting question, isn't it? What's the most enlightened thing that you know is true? Maybe you experienced it once. Maybe you have an intimation of it. Maybe you trust a teacher who proclaims it while not yet having much of an experience of it. What is that? And then can you rest your awareness in that as an example of resting in or resting our mind upon that, which we seek to cultivate inside. Okay. In this framework, then, <clears throat> think about the way of being that brings these two currents together. In other words, I believe there is a place as we are grappling with how do we balance caring for others and caring for ourselves. There is a place for trying to figure it out. There's a place for working through the ethics of it. There's a place for being pragmatic and in effect negotiating arrangements, finding balances. I think there's a place for all that, but it can all get pretty, you know, kind of complicated, a little stressful to figuring it out. And alongside that appropriate figuring out, I think, can be a coming home to and are finding our way into a way of being. That's the wellspring of everything. It's the origin point, a way of being. It's, it's what all else radiates outward from into the world of how we want to be that somehow brings both of these currents together. Duty to self, Pardon me, duty to others, duty to self, caring for others, caring for oneself, comes, brings it together. And that's where we dwell. Right? That's where we rest our mind and increasingly develop the trait of, of resting there. Um, so I invite you to consider what is a way of being that for you feels like it brings together these two currents of caring for others and caring for yourself. In my experience, when we're rested in uh, loving awareness, you know, when we're when we're rested in uh, a mind at ease, in which there's a centering in peacefulness, contentment, and love, rather than fear and anger, um, greed, and disappointment, or shame, inadequacy, resentment, and ill will. Resting in peacefulness, contentment, and love, when you're rested there, uh, the answers to th seeming conflicts between duty to others and duty to self often resolve. 
they, they sort out, don't they? And then appropriate action is, it seems more obvious, you know. There can be a giving that feels like it feeds you as it moves through you, the two coming together. There can be a sincerity of setting boundaries and standing up for your own needs that is a service to others as they hear you do it and they can sit and they can model your own wise enactment of boundaries and self-care and self-nurturance the two coming together uh, in this centered place it's literally like being massaged <laughs> inside your heart or soothed or, you know, like a kind of balm moving through you. And when you're in this rested place, you know, then there's a, a lot more capacity to care for others without it exhausting you or wounding you. Um, Right? So what is that place for you? Can you feel it? Can you remember it? Can you know what it's like? You know? Can you kind of call yourself home? There's a saying, a proverb from Africa, I believe, that we walk each other home. You know, can you be around people who embodied this way of being more themselves? Or can you remember them or imagine what it feels like to be with them? And in this way, be drawn into their own way of being, their own qualities, their own energy. You know, these are different ways into, you know, can you, can you read the teachings of different traditions, different streams, not just in Buddhism, certainly, and feel the ways in which uh, the, the realization of the, of the writer is coming through the words and drawing you into that same realization, at least while you're reading it. So that more and more you're centered there. What is this way of, what are the, what's the way of being in which these two currents seem to come together well for you? Uh, I'm minded right here of uh, one of the first of the uh, perfections in the Buddhist tradition, the paramis or paramitas, the parami of patience, kanti, K-H-A-N-T-I, as it's transcribed into English, I believe, uh, from Pali, patience. Uh, it's a beautiful word, you know, resting in patience uh, as, as a way of being good to ourselves, unstressed, relaxed, released, we're rested in patience. Um, in that way of being, we're more able to be of service to others, less reactive to them, less pushy, less, less demanding. The two come together, right? The two currents coming together. So what are... Yes, so you could take a look at what's coming in the... Uh, the chat, wonderful. Um, you know, love and compassion coming together. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, the quotation from Rabbi Hillel, bless his memory. Uh, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? If not now, when? But if I'm only for myself, what am I? That's fantastic. Right? Yeah. And, I, great. So to speak to the question that I, I hope will be helpful for you, um, from Joanne, are at 23 minutes past the hour. I'll also drop in um, the last thing that I wrote to my friend. 
uh, in the sequence here. I'm sharing something fairly personal with you all. By the way, to this point, if I could add another, I think, um, guiding, pointing out instruction for this way of being that brings them together is a vulnerable self-expression in which you're speaking for yourself from your heart, taking care of yourself in those ways, and the realness in it, the vulnerability in it, the non-pushiness, non-striving, non-proving, non-impressing, non-convincing in it, um, you know, is a service to others as well. Okay, so I'll put this quotation in. So this is from me writing to my friend, a Buddhist uh, nun. And again, I ask you, what's the most enlightened thing you know is true? Or what calls your heart that you can rest yourself in increasingly? So you're more and more stable here. And I, I wrote, perhaps the most enlightened thing that I know to be true is that the universe is one fabric and these thoughts and feelings are just a local rippling of it. That the ongoing arisings in the universe, including in awareness, are a kind of giving, a kind of love. And that there is something else as well, unconditioned, conscious in some sense, I could say aware in some sense, and timeless. So I practice resting awareness in all this, which often entails preparatory practices along the lines of what Guy Armstrong, wonderful, wonderful teacher, Guy Armstrong described, sustaining presence, letting go of doing in the mind, recognizing emptiness, by emptiness, recognizing that things occur and exist, but do so emptily as dynamic interconnected processes. Being aware of awareness, spaciousness, contentment already, etc. Especially those preparatory practices uh, in meditation or um, in kind of setting yourself up for the course of your day. Uh, it's not that you know we need to be doing them all the time. So that is my way of speaking a couple of years ago about what I know to be true. And I'd have to say, uh, I'm still knowing it's true <laughs> and working on abiding increasingly in it. So maybe as we finish here, in the next couple of minutes, I invite you to help yourself kind of move into or rest into um, a way of being that brings together these two currents of caring for others and caring for yourself. Um, as after we end formally, by the way, those of you who want should stick around and we'll be sorted into small breakout rooms, uh, four to five people by my friend Bill, backed up by my friend Art. Uh, and uh, um, But now about we just kind of be together for a minute or so quietly right now. Resting in your true home. Resting in what you know to be true. Resting as what calls your heart. Breathing in, landing, landing in a place inside that is itself untroubled 
even if there is awareness of troubling thoughts and feelings, itself untroubled, itself undivided, present, already full, already enough, at ease, with an open heart, wishing others well, loving them, perhaps in some sense of that word, while knowing also that they are there on their own journey. And meanwhile, continuing to practice in your own, in your own self. <laughs> 